So today's Monday, the 14th. You've got your second main exam this Friday. I need to still put up some sample problems on Moodle. I plan on doing that this afternoon. Hopefully by, by 5 o'clock it should be up there. There's a list of problems. I probably won't have the answers ready yet, but um, I'll work on that. There could be some other problems, like I still have to come up with, that would just be old exam problems. I still have to come up with some actuarial examples and think about what would be um, possible for you to do on the test with regard to that kind of thing. That's something I'll probably work on tomorrow morning. Today, lecture A, more with Taylor series for a bit, more error estimates. And then I want to relate Taylor series and actually power series in general to differential equations a little bit. We are going to transition a little bit to differential equations, and then we hit differential equations really hard after the exam, including Monday of next week. So we'll do a little bit of the transition and talk about how power series can be used to solve differential equations. Lecture B will fo focus on something called Fourier series, uh, which is a pretty hard topic, but we're just going to do the most basic kinds of things in it. Um, we'll have Mathematica do our, do our calculations for the most part, and not on the test. What you need to know for Fourier series is pretty basic. I'll probably essentially tell you what to do if I give you a Fourier series problem on the exam. I'll help you along the way to do it because it is a pretty complicated topic. We'll just hit the basics. All right, so as far as an error estimate, I just want to do one more example. Let's take our function to e to the x and let's do something that's actually pretty practical, practical to figure out how high a degree for the Taylor polynomial we need to approximate e to the x over some interval to within some error. How big should n be, n being the degree of the Taylor polynomial, so that the error in absolute value is less than or equal to, let's say, 0 0.001 for all x in the interval, uh, let's say, between negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. So the error in using a Taylor polynomial to approximate this function over this interval. We want that error to be less than 0 0.001 for all x in this interval. You can use that error bound, the error in using an nth degree Taylor polynomial approximation, which by the way you should always remember equals this. the definition of what the error is. The error itself is the actual value minus the approximate value. Then we get the absolute value of these things. This is less than or equal to some number m divided by n plus 1 factorial times absolute value of x minus a to the n plus 1 power, where a is the number where we're centering the Taylor series at. So for us, a is 0 in this example. And m is um, an upper bound on the absolute value of the n plus first derivative of this function. You might write something like this. The absolute value of the n plus first derivative of this function at an arbitrary number t is less than or equal to, to m, where t goes between the value of x and the value of a in this inequality here, where t is between x and a. He is any number between x and a. You don't want to emphasize that it can be any number between x and a. So again, for this example, a is 0. We're centering our Taylor polynomial at 0, as we often do. 
We don't know what n is. n is the thing we have to define. What about m? Well, I made my example easy. Since f of x is e to the x, the nth derivative of this thing is always equal to e to the x for all n. Right? The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The second derivative of e to the x is e to the x, etc. The nth derivative is e to the x for any n. That makes it relatively easy because the derivatives are not complicated. Now I focus on this interval. How big can that thing get in absolute value over that interval? And actually, I don't have to worry about the absolute value signs either because e to the x is always positive. Well, the graph of e to the x, we you know it looks like that. And between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5, its highest value is going to be at positive 0.5. We can take m to be e to the 0.5, although that's a little funny because, I mean, we're trying to use a Taylor polynomial to approximate e to the x, sort of pretending like we don't have technology with us. And if you are trying to use a Taylor polynomial to approximate e to the x, how are you going to know what e to the 0.5 is anyway without technology? That works. Because this would be true over this interval, but it's not easy to compute what that is without technology. What is it? Well, it's the square root of e is about 2.718. Square root of 2.718 is going to be probably around 1.6 or so. Just in my head there, just guessing. So if I make m a little bit bigger and simpler, like 2, that will still work. But m equals 2 also works and is simpler. That'll be good enough. The value n that we find here to solve this question will be guaranteed to work. We might be able to get away with a smaller n because of what I'm doing here. But if you want to guarantee, we can go ahead and use m equal to 2. So for this example, what we get here is that this is really less than or equal to 2 over n plus 1 factorial times x minus 0 to the n plus 1. What's x? Well, it's any number between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5. I might as well put 0.5 in there. Well, that's less than or equal to 2 over n plus 1 factorial times 0.5 to the n power. And now it's a matter of wondering how big should n be to make this quantity less than 0.001. Can I do that without technology? I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to do without technology. Let's try seeing if we can do it without technology. I want this to be less than 0.001, which is 1 1,000. That might be easier to think about if we take the reciprocal of both sides to get 1,000 over here and take the reciprocal of this. And the inequality would change the direction if we do that. So this would be equivalent to saying I want to choose n so that n plus 1 factorial over 2 times 2 to the n. And the reciprocal of 0.5 is 2 is greater than 1,000, and that does simplify a bit. You can cancel that, too, with one of those. So I'm really after how big should n be so that n plus 1 factorial times 2 to the n minus 1 is bigger than 1,000. That's something I think I can do without a calculator now. How big should n be? What's the smallest value, then, that will make that true? Just make a little table of values to help me figure it out. For different n's, what is the value of n plus 1 factorial times 2 to the n minus 1? Well, I didn't make any algebra mistakes anywhere. I think this is okay. Why is there no n plus 1 so from the 0.5 to the n? Why isn't it plus, isn't it to the n plus 1? 
Uh, 0.5 to the n plus 1. Thank you. That's right. Which makes this a plus 1, which makes that just an n. Thanks for catching that. See that? That should have been an n plus 1. This is an n plus 1. It's a little hard to see there. When I cancel one of those with the 2 there, this becomes an n power. So it simplifies to this. Well, when n is 1, this is 2 factorial times 2 to the first, which is 4. When n is 2, this is 3 factorial times 2 squared. 6 times 4 is 24. When n is 3, it's 4 factorial times 2 cubed. 24 times 8, 192, I think. I think probably one more is going to do it. When n is 4, it's 5 factorial times 2 to the 4th. Um, 120 times 16, which is definitely bigger than 1,000. So n equals 4 looks like it's good enough. Let's see if that really is good enough or not with the technology now. Let's just make a graph. Put it right here. So f of x is e to the x. I'm trying to use the fourth degree Taylor polynomial. I'll just type it as p4 and not bother with the subscript. We already know what it is. It's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, which is 2, plus x cubed over 3 factorial, which is 6, plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, which is 24. You should know that. That's a, third, uh, that's a fourth degree Taylor polynomial for e to the x. That's something you really should try to remember to memorize, even though you can put it on your note card. I, I strongly suggest you try to memorize it. The error is going to be f of x minus p, 4 of x. And I want to plot the absolute value of the error. x going from negative 0.5 to positive 0.5. Hopefully, all the values of this absolute value are less than 0.001. Yep. Uh, highest is here, given some close to 0.0003. It's doing a lot better. We, we might be able to get away with using a third degree Taylor polynomial. The error in absolute value is definitely less than 0 0.001. But according to the theorem and according to going ahead and replacing this with 2, we would know for sure n equals 4 would be good enough. Though maybe something smaller like 3 could still work. If we graphed f of x and p4 of x over this interval. The error is so small, I bet we probably can, cannot tell the difference between them, probably. Plot f of x, p4 of x, x going between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5, different colors. The error is so close to zero here with this graph that on this kind of scale, we're probably not going to be able to tell the difference between the graphs. Yeah, they look like they're on top of each other. Whereas if you go over a bigger inter interval, you can definitely tell they're different graphs. But between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5, you can't tell the difference between them. Okay, so that's a, that's a useful thing. Imagine you're trying to program a circuit to approximate e to the x, where x is between negative 0.5 and positive 0.5. You can make circuits that add and multiply not too difficultly. That word. With not too much difficulty. And you're wondering, okay, I want to make sure in my circuit that I'm making it approximate e to the x within this kind of error, just with additions and multiplications. And a fourth degree Taylor polynomial is good enough to do that. You can use Taylor's series to solve 
differential equations. In some circumstances, at least. Okay, so I had you read a little in chapter 11. That would have been good to do before today to review differential equations a little bit. Here's a fundamental differential equation we've looked at before. dy dx equals y. We've looked at this before. We're looking for a function whose derivative is the function. y is the function of x. The general solution of this actually can be found just by guessing. You don't even really have to do any work. Once you think about it carefully enough, we're looking for y as a function of x whose derivative is itself. Well, we know e to the x has a derivative equal to itself, just like the example we just did. e to the x is a solution. So is any constant multiple e to the x. 2 times e to the x has a derivative equal to 2 times e to the x. This equation says find a function whose derivative is the function y is the function of x. <coughs> Any constant times e to the x works. Or c is any constant. That function has a derivative equal to itself. But what if we were having a hard time guessing? Okay? Well, you could use the separation of variables. In the next example, I will use separation of variables to try to solve the differential equation. But let's pretend we don't know about separation of variables either. You may not remember that anyway. You could assume you've got a series expansion for the solution. Let me also add an initial condition in here to make it simpler. Let's say y of 0 is 1. We know, based on the general solution here, that the unique solution of this initial value problem is just e to the x, because e to the 0 is 1. But what if you didn't know that? What if you didn't know about separation of variables? What you could do instead with a series approach is you could guess, you could hope that you can write the answer as a power series. a0 plus a1x centered at x equals 0 since that's where my initial condition is. Plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed. You might hope that that's possible to do? Well, based on this initial condition, y of 0 equaling 1, that's going to imply what a0 is. a0 would have to be 1. The initial condition implies a0 equals 1. So you can write the solution like this. This power series that you're hoping will be a solution at least. What should you do next? You want to try to figure out what a1, a2, a3, a4, etc. are. You want this to be a solution, meaning when you substitute it into the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the differential equation, you get the same thing. dy dx should equal y. The derivative of this function should equal itself. What is the derivative of this function? Here it is. We're writing that as a power series as well. That would be the derivative. You want, in order for this to be a solution, you want that expression to equal this expression. You want those two things to equal, equal for this particular differential equation. Because this differential equation is asking for a function whose derivative is itself. There's the derivative, there's itself. I want these two things to be equal. How are they possibly going to be equal? If the coefficients of like powers, like terms, are the same. In other words, a1 should equal 1, 2a2 should equal a1, 3a3 should equal a2, I guess 4a4, which is not shown here, should equal a3. Let's write that stuff down. a1 should equal 1, the constant term should be the same. The x term should be the same. The coefficients 2a2 should equal a1. Matching those two up. 
But A1 is it has to be 1. So that implies A2 must be 1 half. Go to the next term, 3a3, coefficient of x squared there, should equal a2, the coefficient of x squared there. 3a3 should equal a2, which is 1 half. So a3 is 1 sixth. Let's go one more. I didn't write 4a4, x to the fourth here, but I could have. 4a4 x cubed, excuse me, not to the fourth. The coefficients of x cubed should be the same. 4a4 should equal a3. But a3 is 1 sixth. Divide both sides by 4, that means <laughs> a4 must be 1 24th. Hmm, we're seeing a pattern here? Factorials. Yeah, exactly. This is 1 over 2 factorial. This is 1 over 3 factorial. This is 1 over 4 factorial. This could be thought of as 1 over 1 factorial. And that could be thought of as 1 over 0 factorial. These are the same coefficients that you have in the series for e to the x. This will equal e to the x. Assuming the pattern continues, it does. y will equal 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, etc. And we know that equals e to the x. So you get the same answer. That's kind of cool. Glad that happened. Let's do a more complicated example. Where you can't just guess the answer. How about dy dx equals y squared? Let's also add an initial condition. dy dx equals y squared, let's say y of 0 equals 1 again. It's a more complicated kind of differential equation. It's hard, not impossible, but hard to guess the solution. We're looking for a function whose derivative is itself squared. That's what this equation is, what it means to be a solution whose derivative equals the square root itself. y is the function of x. You've got to imagine an f of x there in place of the y. It's harder, but it's not impossible to solve. You can separate variables. Let's solve it by separation of variables first. Oh, well, this board is becoming a mess. Somebody used water to try to clean this board over the weekend, but it was not a good idea. Hopefully it's not showing up too badly in the video. Don't ever clean a whiteboard with water. It needs a special liquid. You can separate variables. Do you remember that? We talked about that a little bit. Back when we were talking about integrating by partial fractions. You can get the y's on one side and the x's on the other. In other words, you can write this as y to the negative 2 dy equals dx. Divide both sides by y squared, quote unquote, multiply both sides by dx, even though that's not what we're literally doing. And I, I think I said, when you see something like this, you should get this itch to, to integrate both sides. Oh, must integrate. Oh, that feels better. And after integration, you want to solve for y as a function of x. Right side is easy to integrate. x plus a constant. Let's call the constant C1. Left side's not too bad either. This is negative y to the negative 1 when you integrate it. Should I put a plus constant on that side either? No, it's OK to just have it on one side. But I do want to solve for y. So this is the same as the negative 1 over y. First, you might want to multiply both sides by negative 1. And write, write to 1 over y equals negative x plus c2, where c2 is negative c1. Although, I think I'm just going to call it c now. I could write a minus c1 instead. 
But if C1's an arbitrary constant, then minus C1's another arbitrary constant. I might as well just call it plus C. But the negative sign does need to be in front of the X. Take the reciprocal of both sides. That means Y must be 1 over negative X plus C. Common mistake here people make is they sometimes write this as negative 1 over X plus 1 over C. No, don't do that. Bad, bad, bad. Can't do that. It's a common mistake people make, though. That's a general solution. How about satisfying this initial condition? You want y of 0 to be 1, meaning when x is 0, y should be 1. 1 should equal 1 over negative 0 plus c, which is 1 over c. c must equal 1. So evidently, the answer is y equals 1 over 1 minus x. Hey, we've seen that before. That's the same as this, at least when x is between zero and uh, negative 1 and 1. We already know we can write it as a power series. But what if we, what if we didn't know about separation of variables? Could we once again use power series to find the answer? At least, evidently, when x is strictly between negative 1 and 1, will we get this exact same power series? The answer is yes. Let's see the details. So assume y is a power series in x centered at 0. <coughs> assume that you can do that. We want the derivative of this function to equal the square of itself. So we're going to have to square this power series. Not real pleasant, but it's doable. This initial condition here, y of 0 equaling 1, will imply, once again, that a0 is 1. So we can write it like that. That simplifies things a little bit. That's since y of 0 is 1. The derivative is not too hard to find. dy dx. Just like the last example will be a1 plus 2a2x plus 3a3x squared plus, I'll write one more, 4a4x cubed. Etc. What about y squared? This is not so pleasant. I gotta multiply this thing by itself. Let me go ahead and write it out to help us avoid mistakes, hopefully. Multiplying this thing by itself Use the technique I showed you when we multiplied, I think we multiplied the series for e to the x and cosine of x. Start over here in the first term and multiply it times every term over there once. One times every term over there is every term over there. Then go to the second term over here, a1x, and multiply it times every term over there. And put the answer one line below, lining up like powers of x. Root. a1x times 1 is a1x. Put an a1x below the other a1x a1x times a1x is a1 squared x squared. Put an a1 squared x squared below the other x squared term. a1x times a2x squared is a1 a2x cubed. Put that x cubed term underneath the other x cubed term. Etc. Go to this one, a2x squared gets multiplied by everything over there. a2x squared times 1 is a2x squared. Put that x squared term below the other ones. a2x squared times a1x, that'll be a1a2x cubed. And multiply that times that. 
what's this, what's a through x squared times that one, it'll be a fourth power, which I won't bother writing. I'm only writing through the third power here. Go to the next term, a3x cubed. Multiply it times everything over there. Times 1 is a3x cubed. And I'm not going to bother writing out, out the other ones. This pattern would continue forever. You really have an infinite sum of infinite sums. Kind of crazy. But it turns out this is OK, at least in the interval of convergence. If there is an interval of convergence, if you simplify these like terms, you get 1 plus 2a1x plus, careful with this one, with the x squared. Uh, you have one coefficient that's a1 squared. You also have an a2 in two spots. That com combines to 2a2. 2a2 x squared. Running out of room here on the board. What's the cubic term? I'm going to write it up here. The ones with the coefficient of a3 combine to give you 2a3. And these two coefficients are the same. Those combine as well. So we get 2a3 plus 2. Um, actually, I made a mistake. a3 should be squared. Because, no, wait a minute. Maybe not. Let's see. It's not, sorry. If you allow the a0 to be just an a0, I think that term has an a3 times an a0. I was getting confused as to why they're not two things that are being multiplied with coefficient. But this is right. 2a3 plus 2a1a2 x cubed is that next term. Okay, and you know it's put this down next to that. We're almost done. Hang on. You want dy dx to equal this thing up here. Those two things combined to be a solution, because we're looking for a function whose derivative is itself squared. OK, what does that mean? It tells you, actually, I think I can just do this verbally. Listen carefully and watch for our point. It tells you a1 must equal 1, just like a0 equals 1, because these constant terms have to be the same. It tells you 2a2 must equal 2a1. The x terms must be the same. But a1 is 1, so a2 is 1 as well. And it tells you 3a3 must equal that. But a1 and a2 are both 1, so this is nothing other than a 3. 3a3 must be 3, so a3 must be 1 as well. All the a's are going to be 1. Hey, that shouldn't be surprising. We do get the same thing. Okay, do we say it again? I know verbally, not everybody was even looking up here. You've got to look up here if you're going to get this. Okay? You want this thing to equal that thing with that at the end of that thing. The constant terms must be the same. A1 must equal 1. 2A2 must equal 2A1. But A1 is 1, so A2 must be 1. 3a3 must be this thing, but a1 and a2 are both 1, so this is a 3. So a3 must be 1. It does turn out a4 would be 1. 4a4 would have to equal this thing. And if you plug in 1 for a3, a1, and a2, this is 4. 4a4 must equal 4, so a4 is 1. All these coefficients are 1. You do get the exact same answer, though the power series form is only valid for x between negative 1 and 1. That interval of convergence. OK, so this is kind of tricky. You've got to be careful. It's not super pleasant to do. But it is a technique that works in some circumstances. 
And I will give you probably two problems, two extra problems like this on the next 20 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so the A in, in these examples is the same as the 1 and the Y equals 1 and the Are you talking about first term for a geometric series A? Yeah, like how do we know? The A0 does happen to be 1 here because I wanted the initial condition to be Y of 0 equals 1. But it might have been something else. Okay. In fact, maybe that's one of your, going to be one of your problems, is I'll pick something else instead of one here. I think that, that's what I'll do is for one of your extra problems. Is I'll make, consider the same example, but make that a two. How does that affect things? You'll have to see. Break time, though. Let's take a break.